Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Cause if you go black, red, black, red as well. So they won't see the two red ones in a row. Yeah. Nobody said anything yet. So about the pins. Oh no. Oh, I see what you're saying. Do it like that. I just caught that. If you get it timed to write. Yeah. I have to go like that. Yeah. You got to get it exact or it looks goofy. Yeah. yeah. I think it would look goofy no matter what. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, just this it works good enough to just go. Okay, Chase, your turn. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we've been goofing around for go. forty-five minutes. Y'all ready? Yeah. Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm ready. That's what I'm there doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase? I am Chase Hughes, did 20 years in the U.S. military. I am a behavior scientist, behavior expert. I teach influence, persuasion, and behavior profiling to government agencies and everyday folks like you. Greg? Greg Gartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together this bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott, and I spend most of my time today on Wall Street and in corporate America. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Richard Ramirez, uh, Ramirez, and he's a, obviously a ser serial killer. Most everyone knows who he is. And we're going to look at some some footage of him that Greg found. And there's not really any uh, questioning going on. He talks to reporters some in it, and then, he, and then he's giving his thoughts on some things. So we're going to look at that and just tell you what we see. Mainly, I think what we'll be dealing with is the psychopathy end of it, what a psychopath looks like. We're not going to focus specifically on that, but we'll, that will be coming up. So if you're interested in that, you'll find that great. If you like what we're doing, go ahead and subscribe. Because like everyone else, we're trying to build our numbers. Just hit that little thing down there where Mark is on the bottom and subscribe. And you'll know when we have a new show come out, which comes out every Thursday, unless it's Wednesday, if I get it done and edited in time. So, Greg, why don't you tell us a little bit about the video that you found? Yeah, so a couple of things. We're not, first of all, here to be jury. He's This guy's been convicted or he died in prison, but we're not here to be the jury. We're going to tell you what we see, and we're going to try to add some value to your life when dealing with psychopaths, hopefully. Um, yeah, what we know about this guy, and there's so much out there to read on him. He killed 14 people that he was convicted of killing. Well, they don't know how many others he may have killed, and attacked another 15 and he was random. He was the first serial killer ever to break his whole pattern. So usually pat serial killers are pattern killers. They have a type. He raped, he raped children and released them. He killed women, killed men, raped women. Not sure he raped any men, but, and he used any, a plethora of weapons from a cord or ligature, ligature to a tire and a hammer, stomped one woman to death, shot people, shot him in the head, shot him in the torso, you name it. The only method he had was he went in at night kind of sneaking into your house and would typically shoot the husband if he was there and then rape the wife and children even in some cases. So horrific, one of the worst in the history of America. And he was right on the heels of people like Bundy and those guys, you know, it, because this was happening in the mid eighties. And it was a short period of time. I believe it was six months or so before they captured him. He was captured by locals when they he was identified publicly, they told it the public who he was. He was in East LA. A bunch of guys dragged him out. One guy hit him over the head with a fence post. They called the police and got him. So, yeah, and there's a whole lot about this guy. This is one of the weirdest of them. And you know, we'll go from there. Excellent. All right. Well, let's take a look at the first video. Did you kill thirteen people? It would be improper for me to comment on my LA convictions and on my pending case here in San Francisco. Why? Because of my appeals. Are you appealing these because you say you're innocent? You didn't kill 13 people? That is correct. You didn't kill 13 people? Again, it would be improper for me to comment in any regard to that question. All right, Greg, you wanna go first? Sure. So for me, I'm not gonna cover a whole lot of body language in here. I'm gonna cover a lot of behavior. Um, when I see here is what, when we think about this thing we all look for called duper's delight, 
It's when somebody is exercising authority over you or power, not authority, power over you, and they're amused by themselves. But there's a social contract and they're not willing to go, ha, ha. this guy doesn't have that social contract. He's out of whack. This is a broken toy. And you can see, and if you if you watch this Netflix thing, you'll hear the librarian that he went to talk to say he smelled like urine and body odor so bad that he was terrified to, to deal with him. And he was happy when he said, I want books on torture and the occult. And he said, those aren't in my department. Why don't you go over there? That's how bad this guy was. So he has he doesn't have a social contract. People call him charismatic. Here's an interesting piece. Um, I, in a book I wrote called Get People to Do What You Want, I created a little mechanics of charisma piece. And basically what I think you have to do is demonstrate value, recognize an opportunity, grant an audience, bond, create belonging, and then allow the person to differentiate. And you will be charismatic if you do those five things because people feel something from you. This guy is in the stage where he needs nothing to demonstrate value. People are coming to talk to him. So he automatically knows he has authority. He knows they need him. They know he knows they want him. And he is showing all that duper's delight kind of thing where he's showing all the self amusement in the same way a cat would show amusement playing with a mouse. This guy is a broken toy, in my opinion, here. And if you watch him, he's trying to be weird by all this Night Stalker stuff. And Mark, I'm going to quote you here. He's too weird to know he doesn't need to act weird. That's the problem. This guy is. He's got this manifesto he's going into, and you see him quickly start then to go into his little manifesto and to try to use that to make people feel uncomfortable. And you can see amusement all over his face, and it's internal self-amusement. It's not external here. So that's what I've got. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, you know, given all of that, though, there is still some vulnerability there, I think. We we hear a vocal click at the start. Right at the start, you get a before he launches into his piece. So that for me signals there could be some stress around this moment, even so. I think we get a kind of a misdirect eye glance over to the side, either to misdirect or it could be just eye blocking, could be a bit of both. You know, first first video that I've ever seen of this person. So I'm kind of building as I go along here. Uh, lick of the lips on my appeals. So it makes me start to think that although the question is about, did you kill these people? The focus for him is around the idea of appeal. Um, yeah, that's all I got on that one. You know, the interesting thing for me, clearly somebody um, who's, who's, who's a bad lad, <laughs> no doubt about it, but still some vulnerability there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, so there's not a whole lot of body language here in this short clip. So we'll cover a couple of behaviors. We obviously have my favorite thing to talk about, which is the failure to make a strong, positive, confident denial, although it may be for legal reasons. And the, the time in this video, once you, once you watch it again, you'll see the eye contact goes from about 95% to 3% just about when he's making his false denial, which is not really a denial. He's just talking about that's the reason that I'm going to court. I'm not going to deny it, but that's what I'm going to say in court. And finally, I think this confirmation glance that he's doing off to his left is towards probably a, a legal counsel or an attorney there who's probably giving him a head nod or a head shake. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, what was, what, for me, what I noticed was, and we see this throughout this series of videos, is when he's he's saying these, telling these statements that are rehearsed, they're rehearsed but not practiced. That's why they sound so odd. A lot of people are going to say, well, his second uh, language is English. Maybe, it probably is. But when he's, the way he sets these things up and puts them together, they're choppy. And he's looking around thinking, and he'll say, uh, a lot. He doesn't say, uh, as much in this one as he does down the road here in a, in a few videos. But every time he starts into those things, these things he's rehearsed, you'll see him start squirming around. He starts looking around and starts backing up because he's uncomfortable doing those. And as he's doing those, he's showing us the, the uh, facial expressions and behaviors he thinks that someone doing that would show. Psychopaths are shallow. There's nobody in there. So what he's doing is he, he's taking the on the affect of somebody he thinks sounds smart. So we're seeing him use words and phrases that he's gotten somewhere else. I don't know where he's gotten these uh, things he's put together, uh, these little phrases, but he didn't write that. He's he's read that somewhere. I've been looking. If anybody out there knows where he's getting these, Probably. let me know. Yeah, just email me, thebehaviorpanel at gmail.com, because I'm I, it's killing me. I got to find out where he's getting these. 
So that's what he's doing on there. And we see that again, we see him start squirming and things as we go throughout the videos. The, re, the reporter could have gotten so much more out of this guy if he hadn't taken such an accusatory tone with him. You know, he's like, well, tell me about the what it's, I guess it's a seventies or eighties way of, of approaching something like that. Cause it's just, it's just the worst because the first thing he's doing is he's brushed up against that ego of, of a psychopath and that's all they are is an ego. So when you start messing with that, you're going to get the, that defense back with them because they're never wrong and they're better than you are. And they're better than everybody else is. So in this, in this case where he's moving around when he's saying all this stuff, but then he straightens up and gets that head cocked forward and, and starts that psychopathic stare, which we'll get into in a little while um, as, as he's given his answers at that point. And what he looks like this, this it looks similar to, and I don't know if you, I watch a lot of cat videos you know, I just, I love him, right? You know, Facebook or whatever it is, or the cat video, I'm going to watch it. And this looks like he's behaving like one of those feral cats when somebody tries to corner one and be nice to it. They always get bitten, but they're always trying to be nice to it and feed it and try to catch it and take it home and fix it, you know? In this case, you can't fix this guy. And that's the way he's acting. If you go look at those videos, you'll see that's that's exactly what this guy is acting like. He's literally in a corner over there and this guy is attacking him. So, and so he's getting ready to, to bow up a little bit in a few minutes. Not bad. He doesn't come across the table at him or anything. But we're but the thing to keep in mind is like I was saying earlier, this behavior where he starts he starts squiggling around and stuff and, and moving his head and looking around and and trying to remember all these things, all these phrases he's come up with to give this guy. And if you'll watch him, he's reading them off a sheet of paper in front of him. He'll look down and read something and get back and madness is what, you know. So pay attention to that. Because there's nobody in there. He's trying to act like someone else, something else. In this case, the, and what they'll do is usually is they'll imitate you. They'll imitate what they see you doing or another person doing. And the, only, the other guy's coming across like he's coming on strong. So he's not going to act like that. He's trying to act for the camera. So, and he's a horrible, horrible actor as this goes along. So, and he hasn't rehearsed the, he's rehearsed these, but he hasn't rehearsed them out loud. This is probably the first time he said these things out loud. He's written them out or copied them from somewhere and said them over and over and over in his mind. But this is the first time he's actually letting them go out loud. And that's another reason it sounds so odd and choppy. You there's a, Greg? Yeah, there's a piece of body language I didn't cover. I, I thought we'll cover it over time. But he does do eye accessing. And it's mm -hmm. not to recall some sound he wants to read. He's It's him. And this is Psychopath 101. It's that internal conversation, the one they do have, about what to do next to manipulate the situation. You can see it. Watch him as he does it through here. It'll come up again and again as he does that uh, but ding, and that's the only thing. And then he's back to eye contact with you and then breaks eye contact and <laughs> that amused smile thing he does. It's, it, this is a creepy cat here. Yeah. All right. Did you kill 13 people? It would be improper for me to comment on my LA convictions and on my pending case here in San Francisco. Why? Because of my appeals. Are you appealing these because you say you're innocent? You didn't kill 13 people? That is correct. You didn't kill 13 people. Again, it would be improper for me to comment in any regard to that question. We good? Yep. yep let's move along. You have now entered a very rare group of people in this country. You're in the, the ranks of Charlie Manson, Ted Bundy. You claim you didn't commit these murders, but you're right in there now as far as everybody else is concerned. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. Even psychopaths have emotions if you dig deep enough. But then again, maybe they don't. Do you have emotions, Richard? No comment. Tell me what kind of emotions you got going through you right now. I'll tell you what, I gave up on love and happiness a long time ago. Why? I, I don't care to explain that. Let, let, the, let the quote stand for itself. All right. Chase, what do you got? Well, we see a genuine smile here. And the genuine smile comes from him being mentioned in the rank of these other people. And I think it was interesting that he used the name rank or used that word. And one thing that we see here is he is mentioning to something and you learn in, I think, Psychology 101 called locus of control. And the way that he espouses his current condition is a result of the external environment, not his decisions or who he is. 
And as an interrogator or as an interviewer, even if you're talking to a babysitter before you let them watch your kids, establishing this is a, a way to know I'm going to get information in the future using that locus of control. So when I, all of us here are interrogators, we know towards the end, we can blame it on society. We can blame it on neighbors and influence. It's not your fault, but you're still responsible. But we don't say that second part. But that's one good thing that's it, when we hear somebody with an external locus of control, we know they're going to be a little bit easier to get a confession, even though the, the, the crime's already been done, the conviction's already happened. Another genuine smile at the word, at the phrase, no comment. He thought that was very cute and he was amused with himself. But he also has this circular speak where he says, maybe they have emotions and maybe they don't, maybe this, maybe that. And then this is common with a lot of psychopaths, but I think that it's not his natural speech pattern. I think that he's copying other people that he has seen to present an image here like Charlie Manson. That dude is legit crazy psychopath. This guy, I think, is emulating some of those behaviors. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I agree 100%. And uh, the, the reporter, he goes, he takes the tack he should, tack he should take on this from the beginning. He puts him on a pedestal and says, wow, you're, you're like all these people you used to read about as a kid. You're one of them now. And that's when he straightens up and he's coming forward and gets that head back a little bit. He's like, yeah, man, that's who I am. Because he's feeding that ego. And that's when they start lighting up. Now, if he had shut up for a while, he'd gotten a lot more instead of breaking in so much. Um, but he gets excited and you can hear him reading these things and we can see him reading them as well, looking down and then, and then spouting them off. But you can hear the way he, he words things like you were saying, Chase, you can, you can tell that's not him. That's, that's, those aren't his words. That's not natural for him. That's why it's so choppy and broken. And he's, again, he's adding those, what he thinks are the proper uh, facial expressions and emotions to show. And he starts wiggling around. He's looking around, moving around a whole lot. Every time he does that, that's what he starts doing. Um, let's, but let's talk about his eyes for just a minute, because we were talking about the psychopathic stare earlier. What happens in this case is, and he's got this down, but he can't help it because that's what these these things do. Is when you're when when if I said to you, make a you know stare at me like a psychopath, you might squint your eyes and try to look mean. When they do it, it's almost the same way as when you see anger. If somebody squints their eyes at you. And you're thinking, you're not thinking, is this guy going to come, if you're in an interrogation thing, this guy's not going to come over the table right? because he's doing this. But once they squint their eyes and then you see the whites of their eyes under there, that's the look you're looking for. And that's what we see here. His eyes are squinted, but they're still getting wide. There's a lot going on in there. He's, there's a lot, he's been triggered. So there's, there's, there's a lot, something's been fired off on there in there that makes that happen. And you see that as well throughout this interview. Sometimes it's normal. We'll see one where he looks almost like a, a normal person. But you see just little flicks of it popping up now and then, which, which we'll point out as we, as we go along. But I think that's an important thing to pay attention to is the psychopathic stare. And he looks right at him. And the blinking is usually next to nothing as they do that. In a bar, in a, in a, in a public setting, you've always heard about the psycho, you know, this, I saw this guy, the girls will say, and I looked at him from across the room. And I was, you know, I felt like we had a connection because every time they look up, he's looking at him. They don't understand that if you keep looking at somebody, that's weird and that's strange. They don't get that same feeling we get. With you guys, if we were sitting somewhere and I kept looking at you, that would be weird. You know, if I didn't look away or, or talk about, you know, do something, it would be odd. But they don't feel that feeling. They have no ability to feel feelings because their amygdala are either gone, they, you know, they're not there, they're damaged, or they're, there's just something wrong with them. Uh, or they just don't, there's just nothing in there. So, Dude, Scott, you've got a great YouTube video about this with, uh, what's her name? Oh, gosh, the girl from Theranos. Yeah. Um, I can't oh, remember yeah. her name. Elizabeth. Yeah. Elizabeth Old, remember. Elizabeth, what's her name? From, uh, well, thanks, man. Yeah. And that's, yeah, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. I can, gosh, I can feel me heating up. I'm getting so into it. I'm, I'm going to shut up and quit, quit talking. But yeah, so that's one of the things you want to look for is that psychopathic stare. We'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, absolutely agree with everything there. He smiles there, true Duchenne smile at the status raise that he gets. The interviewer also uses Charlie Manson instead of Charles Manson. I think he's trying to add some kind of friendly association there. You know, Charlie, my mate, you're like Charlie, my mate, aren't you? It, so, you know, a bit odd there, trying to win um, 
win friendship there, but I think that's what he's trying to do. Um, I think we see Duper's delight as well on uh, do you have emotions? Well, every psychopath has feelings if you dig a bit into it, and then again, maybe not. I think he quite enjoys that play that he does there and enjoys what he thinks is a is a brilliant dupe. It's not that brilliant, but he likes it. And we see the asymmetry in the face there of Duper's delight, one side of the face doing something very different from the other. It's very prolonged in this case. Often Duper's delight is very, very quick. It's super prolonged because he, he doesn't have to hide anything <laughs> at yeah. this point. What's he, what's he got to hide? You know, other than he's not saying specific things because of um, his um, uh, his appeal, essentially. Um now, what's interesting for me, I think most of all, is he this idea of he gave up love and happiness a long time ago. He's already painting himself as a victim. He's already started this process of of saying, "I've I've given up on love. I've lost that." Painting himself as a as a victim of circumstances, and we get this heavy breath, this heavy breathe out. And we'll see it later on as well when he talks about government. So he's already setting up this idea of external factors being responsible. Yeah, external factors. Now, the reason I want you to pay attention to this is we're going to see that change over time. That's not going to be what he says in the last few videos that we watch. And there's a long distance between them. But his idea up front is that these murders are not his responsibility. They're already the responsibility of some external factor. So keep that in mind as we uh, go along. And he's painting himself as the victim here and the victim of external factors. Uh, that's what I got for you. And Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so it's not often that I have as much dislike for people as I have for this guy. This is not... So Bundy, Bundy's a horrible murderer, killed a lot of people but had a broken kind of thing. But I, I don't think if, if you probably went to Bundy and asked him how much pleasure he got from X, Y, or Z, he probably would say, not that much. I'm obsessed or something. This guy's a squirrel. This guy, to me, I don't think he's crazy by any stretch. To your point, Chase, he's trying to play the Charlie crazy, but he's not crazy. And this guy throughout his whole trial and in now is all about creating this sense of, of dread and terror. He actually, even with one of his victims, said, I am the Night Stalker. I mean, who says that? This guy was trying to toy with people, and that smile, that, you're right, he's got dead eyes. I, I always say a psychopath, the reason their eyes look dead is because you only exist in as much as your reflection of what they're doing to you. That's how they are. And they get enjoyment, whatever enjoyment they get, from whatever they're doing, whether that's physically torturing you or doing something else, manipulating and working you. There's something in his face that shows that. He's taunting this guy. He knows the guy's there. And then he goes, you see him do that little ball. I agree with all of you. That chin rises in pride when he's compared to these other serial killers. He's got a badge now. He's somebody. And then he goes into his soliloquy and he starts... And this sounds like something Alistair Crowley or somebody would write to have and create terror in the, in the populace. This is a guy who put a pentagram on his hand, would flash it, and who taunted people throughout the trial. This guy knows what he's doing. He's just not as smart as he thinks he is, is the problem. So I agree with all of you. I think there's no body language of con connection. For a split second when he says, well, um, something around, I gave up on love a long time. There's a human in there for a split second. I see animation in the face and it pick up, but I think it's manipulative. And I think to your point, you always use Scott is he's imitating how people feel, not actually feeling. And so mm -hmm. this to me is just another game for this guy. I think he's playing games. His body language doesn't look the only real human body language in this entire thing is involuntary. And it's pride when he's compared to Charlie Manson and Ted Bundy broken toy. I got, that's all I got for this one. Yeah. And I, yeah, I agree with you guys. And especially you, Mark, that one of the key things we see running through this is it's not his fault. And with a psychopath or a, or a, a narcissist, a hardcore clinical narcissist, it's never their fault either. Never. And what, and, and Greg, like you were saying, when they, what they're trying to do is show you, you, as they go through this, he's trying to be what you are. That's why you, you heard matching and mirroring as you, as you go, as you, as you see that happening, he tries to do that from the word go and tries to take on your personality type doesn't have one. So it's easy there. He's practiced at it. Can do that fairly easily. 
when meeting people, those types of things. One thing that, that I, the thing, a phrase I came up with was when you're dealing with psychopaths, you're not looking for a sheep in wolf's clothing. You're looking for a sheep in your clothing. It's great. And that's job. really important. That's really important to to pay attention to because they're trying to be like you. And when they're trying to be like you too much, say if you see that that stare from too far apart and they show up and you feel all of a sudden you feel like you've met this kindred spirit and everything's cool, heads up. Not all the time, every time, but quite often that's a, that could be a, a real problem for you. Yeah, yes, I, think, I think at this point what we're seeing is that him mirroring the ideas that he's been given around society and um, and systems and and mm-hmm. systems are at, are at fault and all that stuff that he said further down the line he'll have gone through a prison process and a psychoanalytic process and a psychiatry process and he starts a whole different set of language and ideas as to what is at fault uh, here but again it's 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 still mirroring when else one one last thing i want to add is is not only do we get that smile and the chin raise on the idea of being charlie manson but like full postural bump like comes oh, one, yeah. right right forward out of his out of his chair he almost kind of leaps out of his chair in, with joy around yeah. that one so. yeah and, uh, this amusement thing for me is what i imagine people saw the last time in their life for 14 people that's what i think makes him a piece of you know garbage to me but yeah as you walk through this whole thing I don't see any person in there that cares about anybody else. I think it's all about his message, whatever thing he's doing. Right now, he's a big name, right? This is not long after he was convicted. He's still on trial, as you heard, in San Francisco, because he flew to San Francisco and killed somebody, too. He's a star, in other words. Yeah, exactly. Right this is, that's his big gig. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm somebody now. Yeah. Now, we'll see him later. Once I think there's some psychoanalysis, and there's probably also a you're not in charge here, kid kind of thing that happens to him between now and then. But this guy, I, I don't see, I mean, there's no remorse, certainly. But that yeah. amusement, that self-amusement at tantalizing or at taunting you is clear here to me. Yeah. You have now entered a very rare group of people in this country. You're in the, the ranks of Charlie Manson, Ted Bundy. You claim you didn't commit these murders, but you're right in there now, as far as everybody else is concerned. Serial killers do on a small scale what governments do on a large one. They are a product of the times, and these are bloodthirsty times. Even psychopaths have emotions if you dig deep enough. But then again, maybe they don't. Do you have emotions, Richard? No comment. Tell me what kind of emotions you got going through you right now. I'll tell you what, I gave up on love and happiness a long time ago. Why? I, I don't care to explain that. Let, you... let, the, let the quote stand for itself. All right, we good? Yeah. People, people in this day and age are brainwashed and programmed like a computer at being nothing more than puppets. This nation, this country is founded in violence. <sighs> violent delights tend to have violent ends. It's Madness is something rare in individuals, but in groups, people, and ages, it is a rule. Killing is killing, whether done for duty, profit, or fun. Men murdered themselves into this democracy. You're you're good at reading your script, Richard, but you're not much at answering my direct questions. Uh, Jason Bourne, what do you got? Thanks, Scott. Mm -hmm. This is what a psychopath looks like when they're trying to pretend like they're a psychopath. (laughs) He's a different type of psychopath, which I'm going to get into the medical side of this psychopathy here in in just a few videos later. And we, we see some thing here. It's just a person who's probably developed no further than middle school. And he's reading a script as you would in middle school and trying to sell it with emotion. We can all go back to English class when we're reading Othello or Hamlet out loud as a class and trying to really sell the lines. That's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing that level of talent. That's all I'll say here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, there's not a whole lot for me here. The only real body language I see here, and this is typical of psychopaths. Remember that when we're talking about the kind of people that are going to hurt, let me give you one quick manipulation point. If somebody's around you and you feel fantastic, and they leave and you feel like, why the hell do I like this person? Be careful, be very careful. That's a good indicator you're being worked. 
And psychopaths are good at working you because they only understand you in terms of self. So they have had to learn to do this to, in order to interact with people. So that's my red flag number one. And I'll bet you that people that interacted with him, if he didn't smell like horror, might have had a different approach because he does all that stuff. He's not as smart as he thinks he is. To your point, Chase, he's, his word patterns and all that or something he's written down and he's just reading. See, three or one piece of body language is used three times. He actually illustrates what he's thinking when he actually is thinking, when he raises his brows and says brainwashed, programmed, and computer. That's the only real body language, any human body language I see out of this entire thing. The rest of it's more this rambling, trying to give you a feeling of he's got something to say. And his something to say is, I, I'm no worse than the government for killing people. And the government did it to get a country started. I'm just doing it for entertainment. It, it, this is more lawyer stuff. Um, I'll leave it at that. And Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, he keeps, uh, again, he's removing himself from all these things. It's not his fault. That's the, that's the thing that runs through. That's the thread through the whole thing. It's, this isn't his fault. This is the country's fault. It's the government's fault. It's everyone else's fault. It's the way I was raised's fault. At one point, we'll see where he says, I'm not blaming my race. I'm not blaming, blaming all kinds of things. And he says he doesn't blame all the things he's blaming right now. Then he goes back to blaming those again and, and right after that. So again, he's and he's adding these statements to make him sound like there's somebody in there, like there's some depth in there where there's actually nothing. It's very, very shallow, very shallow. Um, and he wants to seem smarter than he is. So that's that's why he keeps doing it. And again, we're seeing him read literally look down and read these things and then get up and say him. He starts that moving around again, all that squiggling around and squirming like we were talking about earlier, because that's the, that's, that's his baseline when it comes to uh, when he's, when he's saying things he didn't think up or he's trying to remember because he hasn't said these things out loud. He just rehearsed them up here. Um, and then after that, he sits back and he's like, yeah, I just take that. Like it's some heavy stuff. He's just said, and it's actually just nothing. He just said a whole bunch of nothing. And they're just statements about murder and blood and madness. And who uses the word madness these days, you know? No, that was no. a line. I think that was a line from Charles McKay. Was it? Okay. Because it's just like, it's just weird. He has, there's, he's saying absolutely nothing. Oh, he, like I said, oh. the, he was picking up books on torture and the occult. There's a lot of occult yeah. talk stuff. It yeah. just is. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so we've got kind of political ideology coming out here. You know it's ideology because with an ideologist, you kind of know what they're going to say before they've started saying it. Once you've heard one of their rants and you give them any subject, you kind of know the position that they're going to they're going to take. And he's taken in our previous video this position of government, and we heard this big out-breath before he started talking about that. We hear another big out-breath before he comes across the idea of nation and nation being the um, the perpetrator of, of essentially the cruelty here. He's a result of government. He's a result of nation. He's not a result of himself. That's the ideology going on there. And it's literally an ideological script because he's reading it. And the interviewer calls him out on that. And again, we get a lovely true smile, true Duchenne smile for him from him because I think he quite likes the interplay here. He kind of likes that he thought he was doing well and then he's caught out and he likes the idea that he's been duping with this ideology and, and he doesn't, he's got no problem about us seeing his pleasure around playing this game with the interviewer. Uh, but again, the important thing for me is in videos one, two, and three, and this is 1989, he has this ideology that government nations, you know, big, the, the idea of big government is, uh, is causing the, he is the result of that essentially. So any any death, any cruelty that happens is really the result of government. And it's important to keep that uh, in your mind, because that will change. Not that it necessarily actually changes in his mind. I don't think he believes any of that. It's just what he's heard from other people who he looks up to in some way, and he's recanting that. He'll start to recount other things later on, which will um, be diametrically opposed to that. And that's the nature of this type of person, is that they will pick up 
on anything that's of benefit to them. Pick up an idea, drop an idea, whatever's useful to them. Uh, so that's that's all I got on that one. People, people in this day and age are brainwashed and programmed like a computer and being nothing more than puppets. This nation, this country is founded in violence. <sighs> violent delights tend to have violent ends. It's Madness is something rare in individuals, but in groups, people, and ages, it is a rule. Killing is killing, whether done for duty, profit, or fun. Men murdered themselves into this democracy. You're, you're good at reading your script, Richard, but you're not much at answering my direct questions. I think most humans have in them the capacity to, to commit murder. Uh, it is no, not because... No, we don't, Richard. Uh, they, <laughs> They choose not to, not because they are morally superior, as they so commonly claim, but because they are imprisoned in a web of responsibilities, commitments, no, beliefs, and sentiments, Richard, Richard. and that would render murder an absurd gamble or ridiculous well, self-destruction. All right. Well, in this one, other than sounding like a cartoon bear, we see a lot of the same behaviors and a lot of the same, he's saying basically the same thing. And he actually looks like he's in pain as he's going through this, which I found was odd since he's on TV. I think he would, that would be one of the things that he, he would love the most because it's it's a bunch of people watching him and listening to him. If Mario would shut up instead of trying to be a star, well, he, you know, that I think he would have gotten a lot more out of it. It would have been a, a, a much better situation if you just let him talk. Then everybody could, you could get more information from him. And we can learn more about him by the way he's behaving. Uh, and when his when his when he starts again, when he starts giving these, he was ready for this. So he he had had his rehearsed answers. So he looks like he has depth and is a smart guy. His 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 face, you know, goes into a frown. Almost looks like pain. We really don't see the the grief muscle anywhere. We see it get close, but we don't see grief in there anywhere. Like I'll do this, and I've got a lot going on, but you're not seeing the grief muscle because I do that all the time. So so there's that. So that that really. I think we're seeing the, the same thing, just the cookie cutter uh, Night Stalker stuff here. Trying to sound smart, he's not smart. And every time he starts doing other stuff, he starts moving around so much so it's making the cameras and, and things lock up. That's how much he's moving around. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, not a lot more than you have. I think he enjoys his power to spew garbage and that's what he's doing. And you see it in all the hey, kind of self-amused thing. I also, however, think that he, I, I wrote down, I think he's the smartest guy he knows. If you went to middle school with him, he was probably that kid who was always getting into trouble because he knew more than he really did. And I think that part's one piece that you can see. Um, I did see his brow rise a little bit as he was asking, but I, I think if you really wanted to tweak this guy, you'd shut his mic off and talk over him. Instead of what Maury's doing, I would just shut his mic off and say, I'm not gonna listen to that. This guy had something planned he wanted to say. He needs an audience. That This guy needs an audience is all this is. And I'm gonna leave it at that and go to Mark. Yeah, so um, another, so this is 1991. We're two years later than our last um, last uh, videos. It's another memorized treatise that he's put together. But now it's very different. And now, pre previously, he was a result of, and, and, and serial killers were a result of society. Now what he's saying is everybody is a serial killer. It's just society and, and so that, that, that pulls people back from that. And he's a little bit different in that he hasn't let society pull him back from that. And previously, he was a, a result of society. Now he's saying he's a result of not conforming to society. So really quite different, uh, different ideology that he's now putting forward. Uh, you know, everybody's a murderer if it wasn't for social norms is what he's saying. Now, there's an asymmetry again in the face, and we can see it clearly now. Before the camera angle was at to, the, to the side, now we've got a full face view, and we can see one side of the face very, very different from the other. So often the idea of two emotions being held at the same time, which is why it can seem really odd to be looking at that kind of, kind of face. Uh, I'm glad everybody's picking up on this pain in the forehead you know, where the, the eyebrows are coming up and these are, you know, this area is crunched up. Um, I know Chase would often like me to talk about Rome, but I'm going to go to 14th century Japan instead. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, of 14th course. Century. Nice choice. 
a type yes. of theatre called no theatre, which was a a courtly uh, ritualization of of Shinto ritual. There's a character, a masked character. They're all masked characters in in no theatre. One of the characters is called Hanya, H uh, A I think N N Y A Hanya, and Hanya has exactly the same face as Ramirez in this. I want you to look it up, Hanya. Uh, it's a demon. And this demon is the result of a scorned woman. It's, the, it's what um, this Japanese ritual thought happened when a woman becomes so obsessed with jealousy that they become racked with pain. That's his face at this point. It's the face of a demon racked with pain, and we've known about this face for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, in fact, in in the Shinto ritual, uh, it's it's the kind of spirit of pain and obsession. So you know, taking that on, I think we do have somebody here who is consistently has a level of high pain and obsession in their mind about something. There's something painful going on in there. I don't know quite what it is. I could make some stabs at the idea, but uh, but certainly there's something quite aggressive uh, in that mask there. So that's what I've got for you. Look it up, Hanya, 14th century Japanese no theater. And uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it's a great point about the uh, Sudoku uh, ritual there. That's uh, very good. <laughs> So I think some of this pain that we're seeing here is from him having to recite a bunch of stuff without any notes. <laughs> I think that's a genuine source of some of this. It's strain coming forward of him word for word saying some of this stuff. And I'll come at this from a slightly different angle. And this phrase will sound funny, but it's very true. Most people feel that most people feel the same as they do. So what we're seeing, if, if you want to know how someone secretly feels about anything, ask them how they think most people feel about that thing, and you'll get how they feel. So his idea, he, I think he truly believes this fact or this opinion that everyone has this innate capability of being a serial killer deep within us, but society just turns down the volume on that by giving us a mortgage. I think for, for lack of a, well, if there's anything that makes we want to hurt somebody, it's more, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ever do that paperwork. And I think one thing we're seeing here is another example of how very little equipped he is for regular conversation. And one thing you'll, you'll see when, when, He's going to his appeal. We see people that want to get out of a trial and say, I'm, I'm mentally incompetent to stand trial. And if, as a forensic psychologist, one of the ways that, that a forensic psychologist determines whether or not this person's competent to stand trial is whether or not they hid what they did from other people. Because if they hid it and kept it in secret from others, they knew it was bad and they knew not to do it. And we see some of that start to come out here. We're going to get into the medical aspects of this uh, a little bit later, so I'll keep mine short now. So I'm, I'm going to go long here in a, in a few minutes. That's all okay. I got. I think most humans have in them the capacity to, to commit murder. Uh, it is no, not because... No, we don't, Richard. Uh, they, they choose not to, not because they are morally superior, as they so commonly claim, but because they are imprisoned in a web of responsibilities, commitments, no, beliefs, and sentiments, Richard, and that would render murder an absurd gamble or ridiculous well, self-destruction. All right. We good? good. Yeah. That's nice one, guys. These things, you know, are, contribute to a person uh, to a person's frustration and anger and uh, and uh, at a, some point in life he explodes all right greg what do you got yeah so now he no longer has the spotlight so he no longer remember i said to be to have charisma now this guy ended up married one of his former jurors who convicted him actually spent time with him in jail you know going to visit him and that i mean crazy stuff because 
charisma is an odd thing. But if you're going to say that charisma, you need to demonstrate value, well, he has no value at this point. So he's got to connect with somebody. This is the first time we see him trying to actually connect. He's not self-aggrandizing and sitting back and pontificating yet. He's trying to connect with this guy. And you see it because you see him actually thinking, thinking through what he should say and how he's going to say it. And there's lots of things this could be in his mouth when he's twisting his mouth. What I think it is, is the equivalent of a child doing this when they color. He's using, he's moving his mouth as he's trying to figure out what to say. And I think it's just his brain engaging and he's not sophisticated enough to sit quietly with his face down. He's just done whatever he wants his whole life. And here he is, he's a wild child. So his mouth is moving around. That's my opinion. Um, I would also say his hands are up as he's navigating internal thought at the same time his mouth is moving, which tells me he's trying to figure out what to say next to connect with this guy. And he's not good at it. He just isn't good. He does request for approval, clearly. The, the organ of communication, the organ of connection with humans, when he says frustration and anger, and then makes hard eye contact when he says he explodes. Now he's trying to make this guy wanna to talk to him instead of doing his pontificating about why the ocean's blue. He's just trying to get this across so he can connect with the guy. And this is the most human I think we're gonna see him, period. That's my opinion. Um, Scott, what do you got? I agree. I think this is the first time he looks like a human. He's not, so don't be fooled. But I think it's the first time he actually looks like he's talking about things he's thinking of. He's. I'm sure. I'm sure he he, he might have come in here with a bunch of stuff ready to go, and we may have that we may not be looking at that part of it. But in this in this instant, he's not doing that squirming around as he's as he's talking. When it, no matter what he says, he's just sitting there thinking. And you can see him looking around. His his eye movement is a lot more predominant in this and the other ones because he's not going to, sometimes they'll go to one spot and freeze that's the creepy part so i don't know what what's going on there but here you see him actually looking around and talking and thinking so i agree with, agree with you 100 percent. this is what he's actually thinking and he's he's whether he's trying to connect or not i don't know i can't tell but he 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 looks almost human at this point to me chase what do you got so we see a lot of solid emotional dialogue, internal emotional dialogue accessing here. I think that's the number one eye movement that we're seeing here. But we see this third person removal. A person, a man, someone does this, someone goes through this. So we're removing it. But I think this, keep in mind, this isn't, you're not watching an interrogation. You're watching a sales pitch. And the way to make things more relatable to people is not use the word you, not use the word I or Susie or Thomas. You just generalize it in a third person, you, them, they, someone. And it makes it easier to sell things because it's generalized. When you do hypnosis, for example, clinical hypnosis or stage hypnosis, it doesn't matter. You use vagueness as a way to make the person's subconscious fill in the gaps of that story with their own memory, and it makes it more real for them. So this is a way that he probably has learned uh, very, I'm certain that he's learned this unconsciously, but he's learned to generalize these things. As an interrogator, that's a very good data point for me because when I close him, when I close the sale or get the confession or I need more information, I'm going to say it's so easy for a person to. I know there's a lot of people that came in here who thought X, Y, and Z. I'll use the same type of third person removed language to sell him or close him on the interrogation. And that's all I got. Scott? All right. Uh, I've already gone. Is that everybody? No, it's yeah. me. Oh, okay. sorry, Mark. So yeah, Chase, no th throw it over to Mark. And that's all I got. Mark? Yeah, so let me give you uh, potentially another idea around why this distancing might be happening. Because I agree, there's there's lots of distancing talk there. Um, so he talks about these things. He's now got some contributors to the the, the issue, the problem, the, the, the psychopathy that happens. I went back in the interview, bits that we haven't seen there, and he's talking about ab abuse, poverty, drugs, some other, other elements as well. Um, but he says these things contribute to a person. And when he says a person, he does an eyebrow raise, look for approval, but then he shows disdain. So it's interesting. He says, here's some things that contribute to a person, to a personality. And I want you to agree with that 
at the same time, he doesn't seem to agree or like the idea of the person, a personality. Um, and he talks about that it builds frustration and anger and then it explodes. So you get a shattered personality. So the idea of a shattered personality is, is like there's lots of versions of us. There's the me when I was 14, the me when I was four. There's the me when I talked to my mum. There's the me when I talked to my kid. It's all the same person, but there's some slight differences between us all. It's not a different personality, it's aspects of personality. And some people would say if, if those aspects aren't able to get connected with each other, they don't know each other exists, or they have fights with each other, the personality shatters. And when the personality personality shatters, I just don't know who I am anymore. Or I'll get with one person and I'm the completely different person than when I'm with that person there. If the, if the facets are connected, it's a kind of a more whole person. Well, he says he exploded. He shattered. So I don't think he reckon, he knows what his personality is anymore, uh, even if he did in the first place. He doesn't have anything really solid to hang on to. And so he's finding it hard to locate himself, know who he is, and therefore he doesn't know who's meant to take responsibility for this. So at the moment he's gone, again, there's some external factors here, abuse, poverty, drugs, that caused my personality to break up. And I'm distancing myself because I don't know who's responsible. That's one idea. Now, at the same time, he's probably heard stuff like I've just told you. And, and he might be just regurgitating stuff like somebody like me told him in prison. This guy's head's a drum and whatever bounces on it comes out of it. That's, I'm a, my opinion of this guy, if I had this guy in an interrogation room, I'd treat him like classic malignant narcissist. And I would say, wow, it's impressive that you killed that many people in this short a period of time and got away with it for a long time. And then once I got him to the point where he started smiling again, I'd say, but you're, you're an idiot. Here's what you left behind. Bam, 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 bam. And I'd start picking on him and poking him until he just could not take it anymore. Because I think you're dead on, Mark. He, somebody has told him this stuff. And what they're really good at is regurgitating what good you mimics. show passion for. Yeah, great mimics. Yep. Yeah. These things, you know, are, contribute to a person, uh, to a person's frustration and anger. And, uh, and uh, at some point in life, he explodes. All right, we good? Yep. Yeah, let's move. Why on earth would you have hurt those people? Why did you kill those people? Uh, no comments, no comments. I, I cannot answer that at this time. All right, Jason Bourne, you wanna go first? <laughs> you bet. I think people tend to assume that psychopaths are highly intelligent. <laughs> there was some research in 1976 that suggested this, but there's been brand new stuff in 2003 and 2005 from Margaret Kerr and Peter Johansson, who proved that actually the opposite is more likely than not to be true. So they will have a, a lower level of intelligence. And we see that, it's very apparent here with this low level ability in language and general social relatable skills, which an intelligent psychopath can get very good at those things. We call that mask painting or mask creation, uh, whatever you want to call that. And I think that's, that's notable here that we are seeing a psychopath with low level intelligence trying to come across and borrow credibility and borrow authority from the people that he's been reading. And keep in mind, he grew up during the time of a cult called Est, which was really big in the 1970s, I think in up to the mid 80s. That was a big self-help movement that had a lot of this new age stuff and it, it dabbled into this occultic stuff and it could probably let him in that direction if he was exposed to that. And we see him just quoting a lot of things that are very similar to both of those. And in the next video, we'll expound on what psychopathy really is and how he is absolutely different from most of the others. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, it's back. 
this is the guy. This is the same guy. This is the same empty wagon. I'm telling you, this guy, if if he were honest, he would say, I killed these people because I could. It's a power thing. It's a you, you can see it. You can just see it in him. Because once he gets back to the point where he has value, it's the charisma thing again. Once he has value, he's going to grant you an audience. He's going to realize the opportunity and grant you an audience. This is I, I didn't make up a formula for charisma. I watched people and understood what they did and wrote down the steps because I'm a big believer. Anything I can write in steps, you can learn to do. And he's doing innately what, and I'm, I'm not calling any of these people psychopaths, but people who are on the wrong side of the political spectrum to like Bill Clinton, love Bill Clinton. And every one of them I interviewed, all these ops guys would say, when I met him, he was this person who was bigger than life to start with. He realized that I wanted to talk to him. He gave, you know, he started talking to me. He didn't just talk to me. It was a big production. Then he bonded to me and then he let me tell him something about myself. This guy instinctively is doing this stuff. He doesn't have the ability to do the normal stuff like bond with you because he's a broken toy. Now, whether there's a psychopath, a nut job, whatever you want to call this guy, he's a dangerous guy because that when people went to talk to him later, somehow this guy lived through life. They said he always had money. He always had money for drugs. But watch him, his intake eye, and you guys all know I care about that. That intake eye, the one eye that's dominant on your body, is getting smaller. And then suddenly he's back. He's back. He gets his power back. The light comes back to his face, that amusement that he gets to be. Now he's the night stalker again. He's not some poor guy that had to make connection with this guy. He breaks eye contact. He covers his mouth. His duper's delight, the big joker kind, comes out. And he's self-amused. And he's got the illusion of evil back. He does that eye thing, that you know taffy pulling thing with his eyes and all that kind of stuff. He's back to his product. And that's what I see. Uh, Scott. All right. Yeah, I agree with you. And this goes back, having, having you having said that, <clears throat> goes back to what Mark says as well. When you look at it, it's almost like multiple personalities in some cases. This isn't a multiple personality situation. But what I'll do is I'm going to go, this is because this is the perfect uh, video for that. I'll grab a screenshot and I'll show you. If you look on one side of his face, I'll make it really big and I'll half it up for you. One side of his face, you see one personality. And you see, or you see one expression on the other side of the face. That's where that psychopath is hiding, hiding. Because you see that psycho, psychopathic stare in one side of his face. And once you start noticing that, from from this day forward, uh, Joe Navarro did it you know, the first time I ever saw. It. I was like, oh god, you got to be kidding me. If you look at someone's face, a lot of times, or quite often, especially, in, and there are specific uh, famous people that he, he, he did this with as well, but you can see one expression on one side and one expression on the other side, and that's what we're seeing here. So once you start looking for that, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll be able to to, to spot that quite quite easily. So I'd, so y'all y'all are dead on spot on for that. So we're seeing the psychopathic stare. If you're into micro expressions, this is a great one for you. You've probably already spotted this at the very top. Or when you first ask if, uh, if you know, why did you kill these people? You see his, his eyes squint just a little bit. You see his eyes go up and you see just a little bit of a smile right there. Little the smile lasts longer than the squint lasts. But then he's getting back into that character because he goes, oh, there's me. All right, we're talking about me now. This is what I do. Let's, let's get ready for this. Because now he knows it's showtime. Because that's it. That's his thing. Right? He's his go-to is, is being a psychopath. And he starts taking on that persona again. Like Mark was saying, you see him act, he, shoot, there he is. Boom, there he is. He's, he's become that thing one more time. Um, and then when he looks at the camera, you really know he's like, yeah, here I am. I'm back. I'm back. That's what I'm doing. And he starts that fidgeting again because he's he's saying things that he's read somewhere and he's tried to remember and he's regurgitating what he's what he's read. So there there are as far as psychopathy goes, these are classic hallmarks you're seeing in here from the expressions to the micro expressions to the full on expressions to everything. Now, I wondered about that, that big smile he was doing, because when, it sounds like somebody shutting the door or something when he, when he does that. And it looks like he's looking at somebody he knows, which that may not be. But that's how that's how big that smile was. So if, if he's not connected with somebody or seeing somebody he knows come in for some reason or something, that right there should show you alone there's something really wrong with this guy. Because when you start talking about killing people, when we when we smile and start laughing about that, when we see it, completely different thing going on there than when somebody asks you if you killed someone and you start smiling, or why did you kill someone and you start smiling. But but that's when he that's when again it's showtime for him. So that's when he puts it on and says, Okay, here we go. It's you know, lights, camera, psychopath. That's where he's that's where he pops up and, and he's ready to go. 
My, my guess is there was a response from the person who's interviewing him when the door slammed, they jumped. That's the smile. Uh, I, okay. Cause I knew it was, cause it didn't, it didn't happen timing wise on that the way it should have. Cause when he looked, he'd start smiling, looked away and then, then came back. So I guess he had to check the door as well to see what that was or connect that way with the guy. So he, or, or the interviewer, or the woman, whoever it was, his interview at that point, or I guess it was a guy. So like a guy. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. So um, I think, you know, regardless of whether he is smiling at some at some other thing going on, I think we see enough of a micro gesture of a smile up front right at the start when he's asked, what, essentially, why did you do it? Um, I think there's true pleasure there. And then he tries to mask that. I think that's all that's happening is he's masking the true pleasure. If I were to make a, a gamble on it that I think I would win... I think he just enjoys, gets pleasure from it. I think it's good, fun for him. Um, and he says, I cannot answer uh, at this time. So he does know why. So it's not something that's completely unconscious to him. I don't think he flies into a rage and it just happens and it's all over. And it's like, whoa, what happened there? I think he's totally conscious. He knows why. Uh, I think it's 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 pleasure. And, and I think to chase his point there of, um, psychopaths and intelligence, you might go, well, hang on, if they're, if they're so stupid, how come they get away with stuff? Well, they're nonconformist. Remember, the, the rules of society, we have to join in and we have to kind of self-manage ourselves. There's not enough sheriffs in the world, you know, to lock us up if we're doing bad stuff. So we kind of, we, we moderate, we, we moderate ourselves. We have a part of our brain which moderates our behavior. And when it goes a little bit too far, the moderator comes in and goes, you know what, you're doing that, you've gone a bit too far there. You remember, there are some rules out there. There's some theories that he just doesn't have that moderator in there. The psychopaths don't have that moderation element. And so they just don't moderate. And so they get away with a whole bunch of stuff because they're not self policing and there aren't enough police out there to police them. So they just get away with stuff and they don't have to be smart. You might go, but hang on, there's all those psychopaths that have kind of been really successful and had incredible businesses and they must have been really smart. No, there are really simple business ideas that basically anybody could do and make a whole heap of money at because it's just a really simple business idea. And also they're not self-moderating with the rules either. So they're not you know, playing by the same rules as everybody else. So they are very successful. Um, yeah, uh, Chase, I think you've got something for us on uh, on Joe Navarro's piece about asymmetry as well. Yeah, so that article was called Chirality, or that that topic that, that Joe talks about is called Chirality. And that article is absolutely fascinating. I have it bookmarked. And I only have like 15 things bookmarked on my whole computer. I've got a bookmark. We'll leave it below in the video description for you guys. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether Joe explains in that what chirality means, but it's from a Greek word, which means that things look the same, two things that look the same, but they're actually quite different, which I think is a lovely you know, idea that the Greeks would come up for a word just to describe that moment where two things at first glance look the same, but actually they turn out to be quite different. I think it's a great word. Excellent. Why on earth would you have hurt those people? Why did you kill those people? Uh, no comments. No comments. I, I cannot answer it at this time. All right. We're good? Yeah. Let's move along. They are desires, whereas if, where if I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. I'm not going to blame society, my race, or people, or anything. Uh, it, it is up to the individual like myself uh, to, to keep on knocking on, on whatever door they want to get into. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm going to be real short on this one. He's back. He's back. He's just the same guy. He's pontificating. He's got his audience. He's doing exactly what he wants to do. He's back into his. Now, he is, however, looking for an excuse. I think he's f finally actually calling out a real excuse. Hey, I don't know why, whatever I did. This kind of, He actually is taking on some responsibility. This shows, Mark, to your point, the years of 
the law enforcement side having their hands on him. He's in a cage. He's got to behave a certain way. There's probably also likelihood that he might have taken a little by some other prisoners because you can't, assuming he was mixed in with them, I think he was on death row the whole time. You can't treat prisoners the same way you treat people on the street for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the things you just brought up in the last session where we're talking about psychopaths don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't have part of the social contract. The reason they get away with things is because they're not fearful. They just walk around and they don't show any body language that says it. In the same way, you can go in a place that doesn't allow pets and have a dog under your arm and walk right past the front desk if you don't show any body language associated with it. Because people don't, people are pattern finders. They look for something that's an outlier and something that's wrong. If you act like it's normal, it is normal. And it, normal to this guy was breaking into people's houses and doing all that kind of craziness. So I, I, he pontificates. He's suddenly the priest of this religion that he's come up with over his time. And I, I think that's just more of the same, more of a way to make people feel a certain way, whatever kind of control he gets. And that's it. I, this is a, an empty, this is an empty bucket right here. That's how I feel about this guy when I see him. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. When he's going through his little spiel here, he's saying you can't blame society or, you know, all this other stuff. When he says people, he doesn't mean it. So I think there is some definite meaning to blaming people for him. And as an interrogator, all of us do something called theme development. And this theme development is, it's kind of, I'm going to rationalize the action. I'm going to project the blame. I'm going to minimize the consequences, minimize the seriousness, yada, yada. But that as an interrogator, I see that people is a real strong point for him right here. That's now going to be a main central part of my theme if I'm in conversation with this guy. And there's more generalized language here. I'll appeal to more people. I'll probably look a little bit smarter. And I think this is an unusual case because there's a, a, a doctor that worked on this case. His name, he was a psychiatrist named Michael Stone. And the reason he said that he was different than people like Ted Bundy or Charlie Manson was this guy was a made psychopath and not a born psychopath. Mm -hmm. And they used a psychopathic measurement test. And let's let's throw this out there right at the beginning. Psychopath is not a medical term, nor is it a right. psychological term in the U.S., according to the DSM-5 which is our kind of our psychological Bible to diagnose a mental illness. It's, it's very, very tightly wound up with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, but this test that they use is called the PCLR or the psychopathic checklist. And the R just stands for revised because it was a new one since the first one was invented. And he hit a lot of these markers on here, but he had a rough life growing up. And I think that he, he was also, this is a fact, he was also diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder, which is a real disorder. It sounds ridiculous. And that is a disorder where it prevents us from forming or desiring to form attachments with other people. And I think this added to the fact he was a made psychopath, but this also added to the fact that he was able to detach so cleanly from doing a lot of these crimes. And it wasn't because of craziness per se. It was because of an absence of something. So when you're sitting at a stoplight and it's a red light, there's nobody around. It's maybe one o'clock in the morning. There's no cops anywhere. Why don't you run the light? And that's your conscience. And our conscience lives in the limbic system. And the limbic system in our brain if you look right here behind me, it's kind of right down in this little area. If you stick your fingers in your ears, you'll be pointing at it. That's the part that gets most heavily affected when you have disorders like this. Mark? Yeah. So um, here's now his, his philosophy is it's the nature of humans to be wicked. And so he's, as Chase was saying, he's gone from he's a result of society to, well, you know, everybody is like this, uh, but society represses that. He's gone from that to going, then it's the nature of humans to be wicked. And by the end of it all, he actually says, it's up to the individual, like myself. So he names himself, it's up to the individual, like myself, to keep 
uh, knocking on whatever door they want to get into. And so at this point, uh, it's 1993, so we're quite a distance from those first ideas, he comes up with naming himself as an individual and naming himself as the person responsible for knocking on doors and seeing what's on the other side of that. Now, to Chase's point of, of you know, you'll remember he, he mentioned um, Est, and uh, that was that idea was designed by a guy called uh, uh, Werner Erhardt, and um, it was one of the first people to come up and popularize the idea of authenticity, kind of the idea of like being yourself. Well, what he's kind of done is taken that to quite an extreme by going, yeah, if I if I feel like you know knocking on the door of of serial killer and it opens for me why not? And you get the same kind of ideology with, with some occult literature, uh, you know, do whatever you like, do what, the, what thou wilt, do whatever you like, be the person you want to be. Now, if you're on the right side of conscience, that could go really well for you. If you're on, as he says, you know, the wicked side of conscience, then that could be horrible for anybody else who's around you. And that's what we've got here. So very different set of ideas at this point, which comes down to, I think, the idea of he's saying, um, you've got to destroy or it will destroy you. His personality is to destroy, and if he were to suppress that, he would be destroyed. So he's now in quite an epic battle between what he wants to do, you know, what he really wants, and suppressing that. It's life or death for him. In order to live, he must kill. It's an, an extraordinary situation. Uh, it's not a character I want to meet uh, any time, let alone in the dark alley. Uh, somewhere there. That's what I've got for you. Uh, who have we got left, Scott? Me. Yeah, Scott. Right. What you got? So um, I think the first part that he's talking about that's him talking. I think you're right. I think that's him talking, saying exactly what he thinks. And I think that was his problem: was if he couldn't do these things, it would it would tear him up. It would destroy him. Whatever destroy him means, or whatever he thought that that meant, be it a voice telling him that or whatever it is. Then you're right. He's right back to the same old rhetoric. That's right. It's back to showtime again. He's back being that guy. They are desires, whereas if, where if I didn't give in to them, I would be crushed by them. I believe in the, in the evil in human nature. This is a wicked, wicked world. And uh, in a wicked world, you, wicked people are born. I'm not going to blame society, my race, or people, or anything. Uh, it is up to the individual like myself uh, to to keep on knocking on, on whatever door they want to get into. Since we're talking about psychopaths and psychopathy, let's go through a couple of things people can go look for when it comes to psychopaths. There's a guy named Robert Hare, Robert D. Hare. And he's got a book called Without Conscience. Read that book or listen to that book. That, that'll, that tells you everything. There's a guy named John Ronson. He's a writer, but he does this TEDx talk or a TED, yes, a TEDx talk that is just fascinating. It's really good. I give you a heads up, give you even deeper understanding of the psychopath test. And that's what his thing is called, the psychopath test uh, or something about something. Just look up John Ronson psychopath test on, for a TEDx talk or a TED talk. Fascinating. Really, really good. He explains it really, really well and tells about his experiences uh, in that in that world. Also, so uh, J, or, uh, I was going to go the Jason Bourne thing again. So Chase, what is the, uh, who do you use for your main person when you're building the theme? Who do you, do you go back to the same person every time? Do you have your, your like, for example, when I, when I start a theme, I, I go into Andrew Connor, my old, my old roommate from, from uh, Boston, where I lived there in college. And I start out, well, yeah, this reminds me of, of my old roommate, Andrew. He did, so, in other words, he did something like this. It's kind of like what you did, but he got away with it. And I don't know, you know, I was surprised at that. And so I go, I go through that. Do you have a guy? And Greg, do you have a guy? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go really quick. I have some tricks right. that I use around this. Okay. We're, we're more likely, I'll have some that I won't share, but we're more likely to associate and identify with people whose first name starts with the same sound or letter as our own. So if I'm talking to you, Scott, I tell you about my friend, Stephen. If I'm talking to Greg, I, I'll say, yeah, I've got a friend, Gary, who uh, does whatever. And Mark, okay. I've got a friend named uh, Matt who did X, Y, and Z. So my theme person will be 
associate. Okay. Greg, what do you, who's yours? Yeah, my, I, I'm like that. I don't start that way. What I start with is what, who they remind me of, because I can bake that pretty quickly, right? If there's some yeah. attribute where there's physical, like if a guy is very, very fit, then I'm going to go that way and go with somebody I know there. So I, I don't have a single person. I have genotype, if you will. You know, and if you see enough people, all of us put people in those boxes. And yeah. so I got five or six folks that I'll go, boom, 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 boom. Yep. Okay, cool, cool. All right. So uh, there it is. Again, if you like what we're doing, go ahead and subscribe and you'll know we have a show come out. They'll let you know and hit that little bell down there. I want you to subscribe. So it'll send you a little alert when you do that. And uh, does anybody else got anything they want to add? We good to go. Oh, I will add one thing. Um, You know what? Uh, we've been talking a lot about psychopaths. Uh, The the reality is, is that one at the level of Ramirez is so rare you're really never going to meet one. So sleep well. It's going to be okay. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're rarer than entertainment would have you think. And they're not all violent. Many of them oh. just have messy lives. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. All right. Great well, point. there we go. There's another one in the can, fellas. I'll see you next time. Bye now. Eu não sei se é louco.